Hey everybody, listen, a uh, word of warning. Um, when, uh, when they cut off the communication, you know, if the phones go dead or the cell phones or the whatever, or the electric goes out or the internet goes down and we can't communicate with each other, or maybe the power goes off, beware that's when bad things are going to start happening i'm not saying it's going to happen soon but it'll be that'll probably be the beginning of when um well the purge that's when they're going to start collecting people that they deem they want to get rid of people that won't follow the plan uh, they could crash the electrical system on purpose, of course, and then blame, uh, oh, the Iranians or North Korea. I suspect uh, Iran. They'll say, oh, Iran or China or whoever hacked our electrical system and shut it down when they were the ones that flipped the switch off and then use that as a pretext for war. I don't know. That's just my guess based on years of studying and seeing what these evil people think and what they do. But uh, when you can't communicate anymore, it's going to be a chaos problem. So that's when uh, things are going to get bad. But uh, honestly, I don't think they're going to do things right away. I think we might have a few more months. Uh, I think they'll do it next fall, but I don't know. Uh, only reason being is uh, in the past, communists have always done things in the fall because you can't grow food in the winter and you know you need heat and it's easier to control people in the winter than it is in the spring. Uh, but I could be wrong. Well, I've been wrong a lot of times on a lot of things. But watch out because uh, you never know. They might pull something at any time. And, uh, you know, if the economy collapses because the electric goes off, well, they could blame that with the disease or whatever. Or I don't know. I kind of suspect they're going to blame Iran because they want to they want a war with Iran. What can I tell you? So, all right. Uh, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Jesus. Amen. Greetings, everybody. Today is February 6th, 2021. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, and John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is probably, I think it's part three of Saul, the two Sauls. Well, this is going to be on King Saul. Uh, we're going to take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now, a little bit of background here. Jacob became name was changed to Israel, and he had a twin brother called Esau. Esau was also known as Edom, or Idumea. I believe Idumea was the the what they called the land where he lived. Uh, Esau married two uh, Hittite women and a daughter of Ishmael. So the Hittites were a tribe of the Canaanites. And the Canaanites were part of the uh, satanic human hybrids that occurred after the flood, Genesis 6. Yeah, I know. People don't uh, want to believe that. They want to give 
salvation to the whole world because God loves the whole world. But um, let me tell you something. Amalek was a grandson of Esau from one of these Canaanite Hittite women. So let's read what God has to say in 1 Samuel chapter 15 about Esau, Edom, Idumea, and the grandson Amalek. And let me tell you something, it's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. And people don't want to believe this stuff. Oh, God loves everybody. He would never want us to do that. Well, you don't know him as well as you think you know him. I don't know him that well either, but I know one thing. Most of the garbage you're taught in church is a lie. A lot of it is, anyways. All right, so Samuel's the prophet. Saul is the king. 1 Samuel 15.1 Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people. God's people, right? His people over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Oh yeah, did uh, is Samuel telling uh, Saul to go in there and preach the gospel to these people? Oh, Jesus loves you people. Oh, believe in Jesus. He loves you. He wants to save you. No, he says, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy, utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay, slay, kill them. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Kill them all. But Chaplain Bob, that's the Old Testament. God doesn't feel that way anymore. Oh, really? Oh, are you sure? You want to hear something? Exodus 17 and verse 16. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek, from generation to generation. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Oh, yeah. How long is generation to generation? Oh, it sounds like forever to me. Deuteronomy 25 and verse 19. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies, enemies, not potential friends, not potential salvation people, enemies. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out Blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. Blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven? What? But, but Chaplain Bob, God wants to save everybody. He, 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 he loves everybody. He wants, he wants to give them salvation. Just believe in Jesus and he loves you. Boy, I'll tell you, where do these people get this stuff? Oh, that's right. They don't read the Bible. They just read a few verses in the New Testament that are written to Israel, and then they try to apply them to everybody. Ah, okay, that's how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Check this out. Exodus 17, 14. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will, I will, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Wow. Uh, utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Now, does God change his mind? Well, what does the book of Malachi in chapter 3 and verse 6 say? For I am the Lord. I change not. I don't change. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hmm. How about Hebrews 13, 8? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Oh, but Chaplain Bob, God wants to save those people. Uh, if you say so. Uh, Israel was told, do not marry the Canaanites. And if you really want to argue, you can go to Ezra, the book of Ezra, chapter 9, and read it, you know. They were uh, told to separate there from their heathen kids. Well, they were heathens because they didn't believe. They didn't believe because they were heathens. They were satanic human hybrids. You know what Amalek did? When Israel came up out of Egypt, they passed through the land. Amalek attacked the people from the rear. Now, the people in the front, that's where you set your, your strong people. You know, that's where the, the healthy soldiers are. If you have a column of people, not, you know, just a military, but, uh, you know, families and stuff, who's in the rear? The elderly that have a hard time keeping up. The crippled, they can have a hard time keeping up. And the very young, the children, they have a hard time keeping up. The healthy people, the strong people will be, you know, in the, the front and the middle. Amalek attacked the rear. They attacked the elderly, the women and children, and the cripples. And God has a plan for them. 1 Samuel 15, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Oh yeah, the attack from the rear. Verse 3, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now, why are you going to kill? Uh, well, you know, a satanic hybrid doesn't matter if it's an infant or a baby. It's going to grow up to be a satanic hybrid. But why, why the ox, the sheep, the camel and the other animals? Well, because they had been dedicated to Satan. That's why. You know, people don't understand this stuff. Lord says to do it, believe him and do it. Don't argue and say, well, you know, that's a mighty fine looking sheep over there. Look at that coat on that thing. You know, I, I think I'll keep that one. I, I know the Lord said to utterly destroy them all, but, you know, I like that one. I'm going to keep it. And look at that camel. That camel's really strong and healthy. Yeah, that would be a good... Uh, I could ride on that thing. No. Bible says to kill them. Kill them all. Utterly destroy. You know, when you hear the garbage taught in churches, and you read the Old Testament, you don't understand what's going on. God sounds like a homicidal maniac. 
Really? But when once you understand what happened in Genesis 6, contrasted with Genesis, uh, Job 38, and you understand that the sons of God were fallen angels that messed around with the women and had children, and that's where the giants came from, Goliath. Duh! And people say they can't understand. Oh, that doesn't make... Angels can't have sex. Angels can't have sex. Bible doesn't say that. Bible says that we're going to be like the angels in heaven. Well, guess what? Not all the angels were in heaven. A third of them were cast out. Go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Spare them not. Kill them all. Verse 4. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tilaim, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah unto thou comest to the shore, which is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly, utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, they, that they destroyed utterly. Wow, look at that sheep. That thing's really healthy looking. And that ox, oh yeah, that oxen too. And the lambs, yeah. Oh, these, these are good ones. We'll keep those. But everything else that we don't like, we'll get rid of those. Yeah. Saul was told to kill them all. He was not told to spare Agag. He was told to kill them all. Verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. He has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Wow. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to the Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place and has gone about and passed over and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth this the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? You know? Hey, uh, I hear all these sheep and all these oxen uh, making all these uh, animal noises. What's up with that, Saul? Uh, uh, King Saul, what's up? What's up, dude? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Yeah, he's caught here in disobedience. Oh, well, yeah, we, we took the best, and we're going to sacrifice them unto the Lord. No, you weren't, you liar. You're going to... Take them home and keep them. That's what you were going to do. These animals were probably dedicated to Satan. I mean, that's, you know. Verse 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, Now listen to this carefully. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, 
wast thou not made the head over the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord set thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Oh yeah, it's not your fault. It's not my fault, Samuel. No, no, I, I know I'm king, but it's the people. They did it. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen. Verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Listen to this. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Uh, not listening to the Lord and disobeying is rebellion. You know what the penalty for the sin of witchcraft was? Death. Death. Do you know if we followed Bible law totally tomorrow? I suspect 95% of the population of the United States and the European Union would be dead. I mean, let's face it. Harry Potter outsold the Bible at least one year. Maybe more. A book on how to be a wizard and witchcraft outsold the Bible. The penalty for witchcraft was death. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Yeah, I guess I'm iniquity and idolatry because I'm a stubborn yeah. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath, re he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now, I did the uh, Bible study on the fool. King Saul knew that he was rejected for being a king. Right here. And David would uh, was going to be well, he was going to be the king. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent, torn, the Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Now there's two meanings of the word or applications of the word repent. When the Lord repents, 
It means he changes his mind. When man needs to repent, it means he needs to turn from his wickedness. There is no wickedness in the Lord. The Lord does not repent like mankind has to. There's a lot of Bible preachers out there, so-called, that will tell you that it means the same thing. Our repenting and the Lord repenting means the same thing. Well, it does to them. Does that mean mankind is not sinful like the Lord, or does it mean that the Lord is sinful like man in their minds? Take your pick. Now, when the Lord says he repents of doing something, it means he's sorry that something happened. In Genesis 6, the Lord said he was, it repented the Lord that he had made man upon the earth because man was, the thoughts of his mind was evil continually, always thinking about evil. And there was a time when the Lord thought to do some evil as judgment, and then he repented and he didn't do it. For example, the book of Jonah. God was said 30 days he was going to overthrow Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, which was very evil. But they repented in sackcloth and ashes. And the Lord repented. He turned from judgment. And he gave them a reprieve. But that is not the same as us. When Jesus and John the Baptist said, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. It's different with us. We are sinful creatures, born in sin from the womb. We need to turn from our wickedness. That's what repent means when you're talking about mankind. Big difference. Now, I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, this is not a big thing on that. Oh, one other thing. Um, Sky News reports uh, that uh, the CCCP, Communist Party China, uh, I think it was an intelligence, U.S. intelligence reported that uh, they were collecting DNA from the swabs from the um, the COVID tests. They reported this. I don't know how true it is, but it's funny. That's what uh, I, re I, I made mention of that in a video uh, a few months ago. Isn't that funny? They were trying to collect our DNA. Yeah, with the COVID tests. I wonder if they're trying to do that or if they're uh, using that to infect us with something. I don't know. Okay. All right. So, verse 29. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. There's a difference between our repenting and the Lord repenting. Big difference. Anybody tells you it means the same thing uh, is either a deceiver or somebody that has absolutely not even the most basic Bible knowledge and probably the, the former and not the latter. Deceiver. Verse 30. Then he, Saul, said, I have sinned. Yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless so shall thy mother be childless among women and Samuel hewed, hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal then Samuel went to Ramah and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul and Samuel came no more to see Saul 
until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. So Saul now knows the jig is up. That's the Bob translation, by the way. All right, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Turn the page. Oh, there was a song called that, right? Uh, yeah, I liked him. He was, I can't remember the name of the group. I quit, li I've pretty much quit listening to music. That was one of my, I loved music even as a young kid. I mean, elementary school, I loved music. I saw, uh, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan when they first came out. So, yeah, I'm old. And Elvis and all that stuff. Of course, I wasn't a big Elvis fan, but... Yep, I got to see all the, all the crazy stuff of the 60s. I was pretty young, but I remember a lot of it. Uh, Bob Seger. Yeah, that's right. Bob Seger. Turn the page. I think it was Bob Seger. Yeah, whatever. Not important. Turn the page. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. Now, when a prophet anointed the head of a king, uh, well, of a person, uh, to, to make them a king, that was the Old Testament foreshadow of the Holy Spirit in a way it was kind of a shadow so here it is the Lord is telling Samuel fill the horn with oil and go and I I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite uh, Remember Bethlehemite? Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem, right? In a manger. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. Boy, Saul sounds Saul is sounding better and better here, isn't it? And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming. They trembled at his coming. They knew this guy was a man of God. These sinners were trembling. I mean, you know, we're all sinners, but, you know. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. All right, so uh, Jesse is King David's father. So let's go to verse 6. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again Jesse made seven of the sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. Jesse must have been busy. Seven kids, huh? Seven sons. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. 
And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now listen to this. Now he was ruddy, and withal of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. What does ruddy mean? Now the Lord is, uh, the Bible here is describing what King David looked like. And of course, your black Hebrews will say, oh yeah, man, ruddy. Uh, you know, well, they ignore anything that proves them wrong, they ignore. You know, uh, when it talks about, in Revelation 1, about Christ having hair as white as wool, as white as snow, they'll say, yo, yeah, his hair will woolly. Ew, woolly. Well, it's saying white as wool. It doesn't say his hair was woolly. It says it was white as wool. Ugh. And then when you show him that, oh, you write white people, you you rewrote the Bible. You you stole our book. Ugh. Now remember something. Noah Webster, Webster's Dictionary, 1828. This guy wrote the book, the dictionary. He was also a Bible believer. He also knew over 20 languages fluently. This guy could go to Europe, almost any country there, and speak and understand and be understood. I mean, the guy knew, <laughs> and he knew Hebrew and Greek, which are the languages of the Old and New Testament. Hebrew, Old, and Greek, New. He says, ruddy, adjective, of a red color, of a lively flesh color. Uh, you ever heard of women putting blush on their face or rouge? Rouge is French for red. You ever heard of Baton Rouge? Yeah. Rouge means red. Blush. You know, they would put that red stuff on their cheeks. Ruddy, of a red color, of a lively flesh color, or the color of the human skin in high health. Thus we say, ready, red D cheeks, ruddy lips, a ruddy face or skin, a ruddy youth, and in poetic language, ruddy fruit. But the word is chiefly applied to the human skin. Uh... There's only two groups of people that can show red skin. The American Indians, which were not in the Middle East, and what they call Caucasians, or white people. Okay? They're the only two. And I don't agree with the Mormons that the, the American Indians were over in the Middle East. No. No. First Samuel 16, 12. And he sent and brought him in, David. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Wow. So, what can I tell you? Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed, anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So David rose up, I'm sorry, for Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now remember when Saul, it was uh, in the previous Bible, uh, Saul Bible study I did, it, said, it, it says it, it's not Saul, uh, among the prophets. See, the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord was upon Saul. He, he, he was giving prophecy. He was a prophet. But he disobeyed. And the Spirit, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Ooh. You know, that's a place you don't want to be. Verse 16, 
Let now our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Okay. So here it is Saul's being tormented by an evil spirit, and they're going to find somebody to play the harp. Remember David's harp? Uh, if you look at the flag of Ireland, or the uh, Ireland um, symbols, Harp of David is on there. Aren't Irish called ruddy? Freckles? Oh, yeah. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehem, might that is cunning and playing and a mighty valiant man and a man of war and prudent in matters and a comely person and the Lord is with him wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said send me David thy son which is with the sheep now Jesse knows that his son well I believe he knows that his son has been anointed by Samuel and he's going to be king and here it is Saul comes to his father, Jesse, his father, David's father, and says, uh, bring me your son. You know, what was going through Jesse's mind? Wow, is the king going to kill my son because he heard he's going to be, my son's going to be king one day? You know? That's, I'd, you know, if I was a father, I would, I'd be concerned. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David, his son, unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to, came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand, so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Interesting. Oh, boy. Here we go. Here's where the fun starts. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shokcha, I don't know, S-H-O-C-H-O-H, -H -H, which belongeth to Judah and pitched between Shokho and Azekah in Ephesdamon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and sent the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. Ah, Goliath. Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Uh, according to my research, a cubit is about 18 inches or about half a meter. So six cubits would be three meters or approximately three yards or nine feet, whose height was six cubits and a span. How big is a span? I... According to uh, uh, Webster's, a uh, span is about nine inches. So he's about nine foot nine inches. This guy's almost ten foot tall. Uh, that's like double the size of the average woman when I was in high school. About. Average woman in high school was about five, five, three. So that's... Uh, that's a tall dude. How would you like to have him on your NBA team, huh? Oh, wait. I don't like basketball. 
Actually, I don't like any sports, really. Not anymore. I used to be a football watcher but and player. Uh, Dad was drafted by the minors in the baseball back in... Um, back in the day but uh, then the Japs decided to bomb Pearl Harbor and that was the end of his baseball dreams and that was the big sport back in the day was baseball big 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 back in those days but uh, enough of that And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Uh, according to Webster, a shekel is about two and a half grains. All right, verse 8. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, Goliath, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. You know, people, Genesis 6, it tells you there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. And these people that tell you that the sons of God in the Old Testament were not angels. They want you to believe that all the men were believers and all the women were unbelievers. And then the believing men married these unbelieving women and then they had giants for kids. Uh, is that how the NBA gets their uh, their teams set together? Mar uh, marriages between believers and unbelievers and they have giants for kids? Huh? Is that how that works? No. They were satanic human hybrids. And it slays me when people will not acknowledge this. David didn't go before Goliath and said, Oh, Goliath, Jesus loves you, and he wants you to be his. He, he, he wants to save you. He loves you. No. David took a stone and put it between his eyes. That's, what, that's how much love God had for the Philistines. The Philistines were a tribe of the Canaanites. You know, you know like what uh, Saul, uh, Esau married into? The Canaanites? And then God said to kill all the Amalekites? Yeah, they're the same same families. Well, they're not exactly all the same, but they're, you know, they're in the same family tree. Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man to you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. I defy the armies of Israel this day. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. See, Saul knew the Lord had departed from him. The Spirit of the Lord had left him, and Saul uh, was told by Samuel that he was rejected from being king. Of course Saul was afraid. If the Spirit of the Lord was upon Saul, he'd have gone over there and cut his head off. 
That's why he's afraid. You better be afraid. When the Lord leaves you, you're in big trouble, dude. Now, David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons, and the man went among and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem, and the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. Forty days. Hmm. How many days was the flood of Noah? Forty days. When Jesus went into the wilderness after he was baptized in the uh, River Jordan by John the Baptist, how many days did he go in the, uh, the wilderness, the desert? Forty days. Interesting. Forty is one of those, there are certain numbers in the Bible that uh, pop up over and over and over, and 40 is one of them. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captains of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. So, you know, take a block of this cheese to the, you know, the captains. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elav fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Now you got to realize something. Uh, God had told Israel, this land, I'm giving you this land. Go into the land, kill the Canaanites, and take the land. It's yours. All you got to do is obey, obey, obey me the Lord, do as I say, and take the land. It's yours, but you're going to have to fight for it. And the thing is, the Lord would have fought the battles for them, but they didn't want the Lord for a king. No, they wanted a Saul or, you know, they wanted an earthly king. Instead of having the Lord from heaven cast down stones upon their heads, the enemies, that is, you know. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, yeah, any, anybody in Israel who kills Goliath, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. What does it mean, make his father's house free? Free of taxes. You won't have to pay any taxes. So David's like, huh, the king's going to give you great riches. The king's going to give you his daughter. Can you imagine being a, a married into the king's family? And your, and your uh, family is going to be exempt from taxes. Verse 26. Sounds like a good deal. Well, I don't know. I don't know what Saul's daughter looked like, but, uh, you know. And David spake to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? And 
taketh away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Yeah, you're going to get a, a riches, great reward with riches. You're going to get the daughter, the king's daughter, and your family is going to be tax free. Sounds like um, such a deal, right? So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? You know, what in the world are you talking about? What have I done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered again, answered him again after the former matter, manner. So he asked another group of people, what's going to happen to the guy that kills this Goliath? Oh yeah, you're going to get rich. You're going to get the king's daughter and your family is going to be exempt from paying taxes. Uh, David's making sure that this is the deal. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, but thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Now, everybody wants you to think that this David, some little, you know, 12-year-old, I don't think so. I think he was a, uh, probably 16, 18 years old, maybe 20. Well, he had to be under 20 years old. Because if you were 20 years old, you were... Uh, that was draftable army age in Israel. So he was probably, you know, maybe 17, 18 years old. I don't know. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. So, verse 36, David says, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine, a Canaanite, shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Let me tell you something. When you're a shepherd, and you're out in the middle of a field, out in the middle of the wilderness, you're going to have lions, you're going to have bears, and... Uh, they don't have the same bears in the Middle East that we have in North America, but they've got a thing called sloth bears. But, um, you know, it's not, you know, they got wolves. It wasn't, it's not exactly a, you know, it's not like living in New York City, you know. They had wild animals that would want to take your flock, and you had to defend them. So what are you going to do when you're a shepherd? I mean, you know, you're going to practice with your sling. Or, you know, if you don't, if you don't have a, uh, a sword, sword is an expensive thing. A sling you can make with just two pieces of leather and a, you know, a couple pieces of leather. You can make a sling. And um, if you could hit something with your sling, it's a, it's a pretty dangerous weapon. So, you know, what are you going to do? 
when you're watching the sheep. You're going to practice with your sling, all right? And this is um, one of the reasons why in the U.S. Constitution they put in the uh, firearms ownership because back when the country was founded, you had a lot of wild animals running around, uh, four legs and two legs. And uh, things haven't changed. And when people want to take that right away from you, they're up to no good. Trust me, they're up to no good. And worthless groups like the uh, NRA uh, will, uh, they don't get to the heart of the matter. They, they just sidestep around it and say, well, you know, if only we can make the liberals understand. No, the liberals, so-called, they understand perfectly what entails taking away people's protection. They know full well they don't want you to be able to defend yourself from criminals and enemies and animals and, you know, and them. So, you know, the Lord's armies have, the Lord has enemies. But the uh, whosoever will churches want you to think, well, you know, God, they're just people that haven't come to the faith yet. God loves them. He wants us to preach to them. Oh, the love of Jesus, the love of Jesus. Jesus loves you. Come to Jesus. Have him come into your heart. Boy, these people, they make me sick. They have no business teaching Bible doctrines. Well, if you want to jump, preach on John 3, 16, that's fine. But the Bible says not to give your pearls before swine there's a reason he said that all right so david said moreover the lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear he will deliver me out of the hand of the philistine and saul said unto david go and the lord be with thee and Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he assuaged to go, for he had not proved it. Um, you know, here is you're getting ready to fight with a, a set of equipment that you have never used before. You're it's going to be clumsy. You know, you don't know how. You know, first time I've you've ever used it. You it, that's what he means by proving it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script, and his sling with it in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Why five stones? Well, because Goliath was one of five brothers. One shot, one kill. Verse 41. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for for he was but a youth, and ruddy, and of a fair countenance. He had a fair complexion. That's what countenance means, complexion. Remember ruddy? Ruddy and fair. Uh, American Indians can be ruddy, but they can't be fair. They are not fair complected. Sorry, there's only one group of people that are ruddy and fair complected. And it's not the Chinese. And it's not uh, the Africans from Central Africa. Only one group of people. And King David was of that group of people. So when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. 
And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Philistines had a several gods, I'm sure. One of them was Dagon. Um, Dagon looks like a mermaid. From the waist up, it was a man, and from the waist down was a fish. Disney's Little Mermaid. Her daddy, that's what Dagon looked like. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Yeah, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to feed your body to the birds. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Boy, I'll tell you what. Remember, David had the Spirit of the Lord. David knew that he was going to be king, and he knew the promises of God, that God had given them the land. And you wonder why God, David was a man after God's own heart. Here it is, people. This is the kind of faith that the Lord wants to see. But you got to be in his will and stand on his promises. If you're outside of his will and not his promises, you're in big trouble. Uh, you know, like the TVN crowd. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And I wonder if one of God's angels had his hand on that stone that David slung. I wonder. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the, the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. That stone cracked this guy's skull. Boy, that's, uh, you're going to need a bottle of Excedrin, huh? Or bare aspirin, I don't know. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword, drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. But, but, but what about the love of Jesus? God... God wants the Philistine to get saved. He loves everybody. He wanted David. He, David should have been preaching to him, Jesus, the love of Jesus. Jesus died for you, Goliath. No, he cut off his head. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sharam, even unto Gath, and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. Yeah, they, took, uh, they went to their tents and took all the good stuff out of their tents. All the gold, silver, jewels, whatever. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistines, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. 
Uh, you know, this is something I can't understand. You know, uh, Saul knew who David was. He was playing the harp for him. Or I wonder if there was like a time period. I, I don't know. I can't figure this out. Why doesn't Saul know who this guy is? You know, I mean, he sent to Jesse, his father, David's father, and said, hey, bring your son David here to play the harp for me. And then David goes forth, and Saul doesn't know who this kid is? What's up with that? I can't, I don't make no sense to me. And Abner said, as thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, inquire thou whose son the stri stripling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said unto him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So here it is. David had done uh, Saul and Israel a favor. Got rid of the Philistines. The Giants. Nobody liked the Giants. I'm not talking about the New York uh, football team. But, um, you know, every civilization that has a written language has legends about Giants. All of them. Even the American Indians have Legends about giants. Japan, China, India, Europe. You know, Jack and the Beanstalk. Paul Bunyan and Babe. Uh, you know, I, 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 it's unbelievable. And then people say, well, you know, back in King David's day, you know, people were kind of short. And some people were just full grown and that's, that's, they look like giants to them. No, they were nine feet and nine inches tall. Goliath was, you know, somebody loved to have him on the NBA if he could shoot a basket, which I think is the most useless uh, waste of time is watching sports. Sadly, my brother, who's now deceased, um, that was his life, watching sports. It wasn't NASCAR, it was basketball, baseball, football. I mean, it was like all the time, sports, sports, sports. What a waste. What a waste of time. But you know what? There's people that'll deny that giants even existed. And let me tell you something. A hundred years ago, before the newspapers were bought up, uh, on microfilm, you can look at actual photographs of newspapers from the uh, turn of the century. And I'm not talking about the 2000. I'm talking like 1901, 1905, you know, before World War I of uh, newspapers with uh, photographs, black and white, of giant skeletons. Nine, 12 foot tall. They were finding them all over the United States. They were in museums. And then shortly after World War II, all, the, all those uh, giant skeletons disappeared. Well, they don't want people to make the connection that, hey, uh, giant skeletons, maybe the Bible's true. You know, they don't want that. No. They just want you to think that, you know, the giants were just normal-sized people and everybody else was a midget. I don't think so. They have found giant skeletons all over the world. Now, I don't know about those 35-footers that people keep talking about. But uh, there were reports that in New Guinea, uh, during World War II, U.S. troops and the Japanese encountered uh, giants. 
I don't know how true that is. But even the Japanese had um, encounters with them, according to some written things. And they scared them to death. Of course, you know, if when you got rifles and machine guns, uh, how long is a giant going to last against you? You know, but um, supposedly there's giants in... Um, uh, there was a giant in Kandahar, Afghanistan. I don't know how true that is. But um, Mongolia, they have giants there too. Now, some of these giants had six fingers and six toes. Halle Berry, she had six toes. Marilyn Monroe, six toes. Oprah Winfrey, six toes. There's a Russian woman that's, uh, I forget how tall she is, but uh, she's like, she's probably nine foot. There was a giant living in Mongolia. Um, I don't know if he's still alive, but he was like twice the size of all the people around him. You know, uh, you know, the Bible is true. But the media doesn't want us to know. Absolutely do not want us to know anything. And I'm glad I don't watch the media. I spent my time studying history and the Bible and uh, all that kind of stuff. I never really considered myself a bookworm. But I guess I kind of am. But all I know is... Everything in Satan's world is a lie. Well, not everything. I mean, if he lied constantly, you know, it's like the devil, if he said, well, everything I'm going to tell you is a lie. Uh, you know, and then he, is everything a lie? I mean, you know, if he did, if everything he told you was a lie, well, then he's telling you a lie. Or he's telling the truth, I'm, I'm sorry. I, if the devil said everything I tell you is a lie, and everything he said was a lie, well, then he actually said the truth. So he, that would make him a liar. Well, the devil is a liar, but yeah. So, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, if the devil told you everything he was going to say was a lie and everything he said was a lie, he would be telling the truth, which would not be a lie. Yeah, okay. I, I hope you get that. I hope I get that. All right, everybody. Um, we will do Samuel chapter 18, 1 Samuel 18, when, uh, the next Bible study. I don't know how long I'm going to be around. One more strike off YouTube and I'm gone. So, all right. Well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.